All right, hello and welcome back to Online English Class. I hope you guys had an excellent uh, Easter weekend, a little extended break there. Uh, and uh, today we're going to go ahead and uh, jump back into our work um, with uh, with two feet. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and jump uh, talk through our top of the week announcements together. All right, so uh, we continue to have no uh, vocabulary and grammar quizzes. All right, so I don't want there to be any confusion about that. Uh, today you need to send an email confirming your completion of your reading for part one of 1984. You need to have read 100% of part one of 1984, which we are going to uh, uh, analyze throughout the course of this week, uh, the eight chapters of part one. Uh, then throughout the course of this week you need to be reading uh, part two, chapters one through six of 1984. All right, uh, that reading check needs to be sent to me by next Monday. All right, so the reading check for part one is due by today at 3 p.m. Uh, your reading for next week uh, needs also to have a reading check confirmed by next Monday. Uh, and then by Thursday at 3 p.m., all right, so this is a little different assignment, I need email confirmation that you completed uh, OTN 1, which re was your our close reading of Chapter 1 together, okay? So uh, uh, you got this email to send uh, today, and you got this email to send on Thursday. All right, uh, and then aside from that, you just need to continue working on our OTNs as we complete them in class. Today we're going to begin working on OTN 2 uh, together. All right, uh, aside from all that, you uh, have a quarter four essay, which is going to be due in the middle of May, about one month from now. So uh, to prepare you for your work on your quarter four essay, uh, which I hope you've already downloaded and taken a look at the prompt. Today, we're going to spend half of our class looking carefully uh, at the prompt for your quarter four essay. All right, so uh, let's take a look at that prompt. If you have a copy, go ahead and pull it out and let's take a look at it together. Uh, if you don't have a copy, uh, then you need to download one as soon as possible. All right, so this assignment is for both the honors uh, and regular English 2 students, all right? Uh, it is a three to five page argumentative essay, which means, all right, that you are going to be defending a thesis, and that thesis is going to develop something called a claim of value, all right? So um, the, uh, a claim of value is a kind of argument in which you are uh, arguing about or developing a reasonable case for the value of a thing. You are evaluating something, okay? So uh, we as human beings do this all the time, right? Uh, we argue about what the best movie in the Avengers series is, okay? We argue about uh, what the best pizza chain is. Is it Domino's or Papa John's, right? We uh, establish evaluatory arguments, okay? And if, uh, obviously, uh, if you're going to have a reasonable argumentative position uh, that develops a claim of value, which is your opinion about the relative goodness or badness of a thing, all right? then you need to have criteria or reasons to support your assertion, right? You cannot, in, uh, uh, in reasonable argumentation, say, uh, Papa John's is the best pizza chain. And then someone says, why? And you offer no criteria. You simply say, because I say so. Because it's the best. Because, all right, you need to have a series of what we would call supporting assertions that defend, all right, or uh, support your evaluation of this thing, okay? The stronger your support is, the more persuasive your argument, okay? So uh, there are no outside resources that are needed for this essay, okay? Uh, you can simply uh, defend your claim of value, support your evaluatory argument uh, with your own reasons. All right. Uh, the essay needs to be double spaced and typed in 12 point Times New Roman or Arial font. Okay. In other words, it needs to follow MLA formatting guidelines. Okay. Uh, that's because here in this English class we follow the Modern Language Association's standards for formatting 
academic documents. All right, so let's read this prompt uh, carefully together. When is it due, first of all? Uh, middle of May. All right, so let's look at the prompt. When students of literature mention the, quote, literary canon, I don't know if you've got, you guys have ever heard uh, me say that word before, but the literary canon is just a group of books, all right, that are those works that have come to be considered standard or traditionally included in the classroom and published in textbooks, okay? These works are revered because they have been deemed, quote, suitable for admiration and study rendering rich meanings across a variety of historical and cultural context, okay? An example of uh, a book that is suitable for admiration and study, that is a part of our literary canon, okay, is a book like Frankenstein. Uh, it was published in the early 1800s, and it is still being read uh, in the 21st century because it has been deemed, despite the fact that it is old, all right, uh, it has been deemed valuable and suitable for admiration and study. Same with the works of Shakespeare. Same with the works of Sophocles, all right, with Oedipus the King. Same with the work of Virgil in the Aeneid. Uh, same with the work of Dante in the Inferno. These are old books that are part of what we call the literary canon, okay, the standard or traditional works that have been studied over and over again uh, in schools by students because they have been deemed worthy of admiration, right? Though this definition seems relatively simple, establishing the criteria for what exactly makes a text, quote, suitable for admiration and study is hotly debated and determining which text fit those criteria is even more contentious, okay? So the two, the two things that people tend to argue about when it comes to what books students should read in school, essentially, is, all right, what are the parameters that define a good book, all right? So what is the box that a good book fits in, all right? So we, we've got to define what good is. And then, all right, we've got to define which, bo which books fit in this box, all right? For example, I was at a literary, uh, uh, an AP Lit conference a couple years ago, and I told one of my uh, fellow teachers that I teach a text called Heart of Darkness, which some of you have studied with me. And she literally cursed me out at lunch in front of a whole group of other teachers. It was insane, all right? Uh, it, uh, it, it, I wasn't personally offended. I mostly just laughed, all right? Uh, but it, it, it was an example of us two teachers uh, of literature having very different definitions of what a good or suitable text is and whether or not Heart of Darkness fits into that box, okay? So traditionalists tightly guard the canon, believing it to be a stronghold that protects a culture's and our culture's most beautiful statements of shared internal experiences, moral ideas, and philosophical reflections. Okay, so think of a book like The Inferno, right? Uh, it, it articulates some of the moral ideals central to Western culture, some of the philosophical ref reflections about ethics uh, and Christian theology, and the internal experience of an individual going through the process of attempting to know God and himself. On the other hand, some critics of the canon argue that an established set of great books is unnecessary and arbitrary. In other words, who gets really to define what a great book is. What's the difference between uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid and uh, the Virgil's Aeneid in the end? One's old, one's new. Aside from that, uh, calling it good is just your personal opinion, okay? Uh, even more aggressive critics argue that the canon is an antiquated form of passing on uh, certain kinds of privilege, all right? So the books themselves help safeguard the power of elites at the expense of those who do not have it, okay? So I wouldn't worry too much about that uh, criticism. Even so, it's obvious that some books are better than others, right? Some books are better than others, 
That's obvious, okay? If I wrote down, uh, if I wrote uh, my own quote-unquote book today, and it said, uh, you know, Danny Thomas walked down the street and uh, uh, a bird uh, passed over his head and landed on his shoulder, and uh, then Danny went home and fell asleep and woke up the next morning, and he was a bird. Um, and that's the end of the story. Then that would not be a very good book. Okay, I could argue all I wanted that it was uh, this deep symbolism and uh, totally an allegory for, you know, blah, 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 blah. But ultimately, it would be a crappy book. All right, so we know that some books are better than others. And we know also that part of being a well-educated person means that you have read some of the good ones. All right, um, uh, uh, you, you, part of what it means to be a well-educated person is that you've engaged with the ideas that are articulated in good books. All right. So in light of these basic principles, students of literature are on some level required to make value judgments about the quality of a piece of textual art using at least one of the following criteria. Okay. So in other words, me, your teacher, who is a student of literature, right? whenever I am deciding what books that you read, what books that we're going to study, Right? I have a lot of options. There are a lot of books that have been written over the course of human history uh, and, and a lot of books that have been written in the time periods that I want to teach. And so when I'm making the choice what I want to teach, I'm basically evaluating the quality of those works, including some, and leaving out others according to uh, at least one of these three standards. Okay, First, the beauty of the work, all right? the quality of the writing, the extent to which the book is beautiful, well-structured, well-written. Uh, well uh, I think uh, specifically of a book like um, uh, The Inferno that is, despite the fact, uh, regardless of its meanings, just beautifully written. Uh, 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 nice to read. Okay, so uh, uh, on some level, we evaluate the beauty of the work, the quality of the art, the wisdom of the insights offered by the work. Okay, so here I often think uh, about a text like Frankenstein, which is not only a very beautiful work, but it offers something that is distinctly valuable to a young student. All right, uh, the thinking about what it means. Um, uh, to to uh, both be uh, in need of intimacy and love and respect and also to be responsible for giving uh, intimacy, love, and respect. Uh, and or, all right, last criteria would be the cultural significance of the work. Okay, so when we talk about the cultural significance of the work, we're not necessarily saying that the work is wise or gives you like some good truth. And we're not just saying that it's like beautiful or well written, but we're saying that it is representative of our culture's or a culture's value system. Okay, for that I think a lot of a book called *Heart of Darkness* that you've probably studied with me. Okay, that book offers a very dark portrayal of the world that is nihilistic and ultimately uh, signals that the world is meaningless and human efforts to try and make meaning out of the world and make meaning of that, their experiences are ultimately uh, uh, meaningless or pointless. So that's not necessarily something I want you to carry with you into your life. Okay. In fact, I believe quite the opposite of Conrad's nihilism. But is the work culturally significant? Does it articulate uh, and, and offer a firsthand experience of an important moment in our culture's history and an attitude and a voice that represents that moment? Yes, it's culturally significant. All right. So your job during the next month is to write an argumentative essay that defends or refutes all right that is to say it either defends the value or challenges and undermines the value of the study and admiration 
of one of the literary texts that we have read together. And it can be from any, uh, from either Honors English 1, if you took it here, all right, or Honors English 2, which you are taking here, okay? So you are writing an essay that is either going to explain why it is good to study, which is to say to read carefully and to learn from, not just to read on the beach, but to study, to read carefully and to learn from, and admire, which is to say to deem beautiful and valuable, worthy of admiration. One of the texts that we've read together could be Othello, could be Merton of Venice, could be Gulliver's Travels, could be the Aeneid. Uh, and you would want to explain to me why that work is worthy of study and admiration according to at least one of the following criteria, okay? It's formal beauty, it's articulation of something that is wise, and or it's cultural significance, all right? So what is the evidence of your essay going to look like, all right? Well, Basically, your evidence needs to support your central claim. Your central claim needs to respond to the prompt. This, the, the central concern of the prompt is uh, evaluate one text that we've read together. Okay, So you're going to evaluate the quality of one of the texts that we've studied together, defending or refuting. Okay, So you can critique the text. You could uh, say, uh, explain why it's not worthy of study and admiration. and But your reasoning cannot be uh, because I hate reading or because it was dumb. Uh, you need to explain why it isn't worthy of study and admiration according to criteria that are actually reasonable uh, uh, criteria to evaluate uh, a text that we would read in school. Okay, so how are you going to support your central claim? Well, your central claim is essentially going to say this book is good or this book is worthy of study and admiration. And then it's going to say because of the, and then you're going to offer your criteria or the reasons that are going to support your central claim. We call that a line of reasoning. Okay, so make sure that your body paragraphs offer a, a, a clear support a clear piece of support for your thesis and then you can move on to your next piece of clear support and then your final and then you're done okay so is it beautiful is it formally beautiful is it excellent literary art if so how can you prove it does it offer some universal wisdom if so what is the wisdom and how can you prove that the text is offering students this wisdom and or finally, is it culturally significant? If so, what is the cultural significant significance and why is that important for students to understand? All right, so that is a summary of the task that is required of you on your final essay, All right? Once again, it's a short essay, no outside resources needed, an evaluatory argument that is going to establish and defend your opinion of one, of these texts. All right, go for it. All right, so without any further uh, uh, on that essay prompt, we're going to spend uh, the last few minutes here. Okay, we don't have much time left. Um, uh, just beginning our work on OTN2. Okay, so we're going to turn our attention back to 1984, which, of course, you could write your essay about if you wanted to. All right. Now, uh, our next OTN is going to analyze chapters two through six of part one of 1984. Okay, so you, you should have already read all of part one and we're going to be analyzing uh, these points, all right, about uh, part one, chapter two through six. But before we do that, uh, let's just go ahead and complete our SQ3R and then on Wednesday and Thursday we'll work through all of these analytical points. All right, let's jump into it. So, uh, as usual, we want to start by uh, just uh, reminding ourselves who is speaking uh, in the uh, portion of text that we're studying, which is uh, chapters 2 through 6 um, of part 1. Our speaker is just the third person omniscient narrator uh, who is aware of Winston's thoughts 
Uh, this is a common literary device that is used uh, to help a novelist focalize the narrative on the internal processes of the protagonist. Okay, um, So in other words, the narrator knows everything uh, that the protagonist, Winston Smith, is thinking or feeling, uh, and, and the, the narrator has access to uh, the deepest, darkest thoughts uh, of the protagonist, Okay, which sometimes can be uncomfortable, uh, but are always uh, meaningful for illustrating the significance of the protagonist conflict. All right, so what is the genre uh, and the style here? Uh, once again, it's called dystopian fiction. We've already established this. Uh, it's set in the near future, uh, and dystopia just simply refers to a genre of fiction that explores the worst possible world, the worst possible scenario uh, for the human soul, okay? Um, the title of this section of text is chapters 2 through 6 of part 1. Uh, this is going to explore the dystopian environment in more detail than was offered to us in chapter 1, and to characterize the protagonist more fully, uh, adding significance to Winston's rebellion as he attempts to reclaim his humanity. Okay, So the more we understand the nature of this dystopian environment, the more we understand uh, the meaning behind Winston's attempt, all right, to establish his freedom from it, okay? So uh, in our analysis of chapters two through six, we're just going to basically be fleshing out our understanding of the dystopian environment and also fleshing out our understanding of Winston's character, all right? Um, central question, how does the novel's narration in chapter two through six develop our understanding of the dystopian environment and continue to characterize the complex protagonist Winston, Winston Smith as he attempts to rebel against the party's totalitarian control. Okay, simple question. Uh, that's what we're going to be working on in the coming two class periods after this one is done. But what I want to spend uh, the next sort of five minutes doing before we close things down is just summarizing exactly what happened all right, in uh, this portion of the novel. All right, so uh, obviously it's a pretty lengthy portion, chapters two uh, through six, and I'm just going to summarize what happens in each one of them. All right, and in your own notes, I need you to write summaries of what happens in each one of the chapters to solidify your understanding of what's going on in the novel. Okay, so uh, in chapter two, Winston hears a knock on his door, all right, after he is done writing down with Big Brother, down with Big Brother, down with Big Brother, over and over again, emphatically. Uh, and he thinks that it's probably just the thought police that are already there uh, to take him away uh, and to, to, to kill him, uh, to destroy him, to vaporize him, to make him an unperson. But it's not. Uh, it's just his neighbor, uh, Miss Parsons, all right? Uh, he then goes on to describe, while he's helping the Par Miss Parsons out with her leaky plumbing, uh, the Parson children, uh, who are fiercely devoted to the party. Um, uh, and uh, that, that, that meditation on the way in which the party is sort of upset or uh, redefined family dynamics is something we're going to be talking about a little bit tomorrow, all right? Um, then Winston returns to his room, uh, where he thinks about this dream, an important dream that I want to call your attention to, uh, that he sort of, that's a motif in the novel, and, and this is this dream that he has where someone like O'Brien is telling him that they're going to meet in the place where there, quote, is no darkness. We're going to meet in the place where there's no darkness. That fills him with this kind of temporary hope, but then uh, he continues to oscillate between hope and hopelessness, and he has this sort of internal dissonance um, in which he concludes by affirming that his thought crime is going to end with nothing. It's going to cost him his life. Okay? Uh, that night, while Winston is sleeping, Winston dreams uh, of being on a sinking ship with his mother, uh, who he feels it, he is responsible for the death of. All right? Uh, he then dreams of a place called the Golden Country, or that he calls the Golden Country. It's this sort of uh, rural, uh, natural setting outside of the city, uh, and he's there with a, a dark-haired girl um, who runs toward him, and she sort of uh, disrobes, she throws off her clothing, um, and he's together with her, and, and, and he's happy, uh, and he wakes up, and he says the word, and he has the word Shakespeare on his lips, okay, so uh, the, the word Shakespeare, he's obviously never read any Shakespeare, uh, reading Shakespeare is illegal uh, in 
uh, Oceana, or the unedited versions of Shakespeare, at least. All right. Um, uh, then Winston gets out of bed. He starts doing his party-imposed workouts. All right. So they make him work out every day, uh, regardless of where the, whether he wants to. Um, and he just considers the fact that his memory uh, has been so deeply altered and lost. He can't remember his childhood. Uh, and then he considers the ways in which the party has actually altered history um, to change official records to reflect uh, that they have always been at war with their current enemy, Eurasia, okay? Uh, which is not true, uh, obviously. Uh, their alliances change constantly between Eurasia and East Asia and these other su super states like Oceania. Um, uh, but uh, the official records just simply say that, that whoever the current enemy of the party is has always been the enemy of the party. Because if not, then that would mean that the party used to be fighting against an, uh, a, a group of people who they now consider to be good. Uh, and those gr that group of people did not fall. Uh, there was no peace treaty. Uh, the war didn't come to an end. So that must mean they either lost the war uh, or, uh, or at least they didn't win the war. And that would obviously uh, indicate the fact that the party was less than omnipotent, uh, and therefore uh, the fact they have to have they have to be always at war with the same enemy all the time, even when that enemy changes. So they obviously have to change the records. All right. Uh, they also uh, 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 he he considers the fact that Big Brother, all right, this entity, this leader of the party, uh, is now uh, sort of uh, being being uh, uh, thought of or written about that he existed all the way back in the 1930s when Winston remembers himself that he really took power or Big Brother began to be spoken of uh, and took power in the 1960s. Okay, um, So in other words, Winston's memory doesn't reflect the official records in his society. Okay, um, And this obviously causes uh, more sort of internal dissonance, gaslighting his own understanding of himself as a sane person, okay, uh, who can rely on his memories to be accurate reflections of what has happened to him, what has come to pass, okay. Uh, later, Winston goes to work at the records department where he works uh, in the Ministry of Truth. Uh, he alters official records to reflect updates in the party's policies and Big Brother's edicts. Uh, he basically describes uh, in that chapter uh, the process of writing out of history a guy named Comrade Withers, who Big Brother was uh, gave a speech in praise of, who uh, later became a traitor and was vaporized uh, by the party. So, in other words, Big Brother can't obviously be on record praising an individual who came to be an enemy of the party and was destroyed or vaporized, made an unperson, or written out of existence. Uh, that would not make any sense. That would mean that Big Brother had made a mistake. So uh, Winston's job is to rewrite the official records, the newspaper clippings uh, that made a record of that speech so that it didn't actually happen, right? He's altering the primary sources and therefore altering history, okay? All that is left is the memory, and guess what? Memory fades. Memory is individual. Memory is subject to change. All right, the records, the records are supposed to be objective. He alters the records, and you alter reality. Okay, so goes the reasoning. All right, uh, he basically makes up a guy named Comrade Ogilvy, uh, who is just not even real. All right, and he writes him into existence. Uh, Winston then eats his lunch with a guy named Syme, uh, who is working uh, in another uh, branch of the Ministry of Truth, working on a dictionary for Newspeak. Uh, Newspeak is just the language that the party is creating for usage in Oceana. And Syme explains how the new language is going to cut out words and narrow the range of uh, the party members' cognition, because they literally will not know words that will make rebellion uh, or that would make rebellion and rebellious thoughts possible, okay? Um, so in other words, they're, they're cutting out words from the language, narrowing the range of thought of their citizens to make them more uh, obedient, all right? 
Uh, a guy named Parsons, obviously the husband of Miss Parsons, referred to earlier, uh, who is the neighbor of Winston, comes, uh, elicits funds for this thing called Hate Week. Uh, and then there's an announcement about an, quote, increase in chocolate rations that uh, Winston obviously uh, be doesn't believe is true and that he remembers uh, it actually being a cut, all right? Um, but again, that only exists in his own mind. All right. Uh, finally, that evening in the sixth chapter, Winston reflects on uh, and, and records his memory of his last sexual encounter. Okay, so uh, we'll be talking about uh, the party's approach to sex and human sexuality uh, throughout the course of these lectures, uh, these uh, analysis. And his last sexual encounter was with a prostitute, and it was very, very unpleasant. All right, um, she was a member of the class called the proles, who are the working class, the poor of uh, Oceana's society. They are uneducated uh, and they just simply work in factories uh, or in other menial forms of labor. Okay? Um, he considers the way in which the party hates uh, sex and he thinks uh, about his uh, failed marriage with a woman named Catherine um, uh, uh, in which uh, uh, sex, uh, they had a very, very terrible sexual relationship which is bad in a marriage obviously. Okay? Uh, and then Finally, uh, Winston concludes that an enjoyable sexual affair, uh, something that brings two individuals uh, together uh, in mutual delight, uh, uh, in mutual um, uh, in intimate connection with one another, uh, would be a physical rebellion that would incarnate his internal rebellion against the party. Okay? This obviously foreshadows his relationship, his romantic relationship with Julia, uh, the girl from the fiction department. Okay, so uh, tomorrow we're going to be analyzing uh, a number of uh, key points from uh, these chapters. Today we just simply summarized uh, what happened. Hopefully that gave you a clear picture of what you were reading uh, last week. And then uh, tomorrow we're going to get an even uh, more detailed snapshot of what Orwell means uh, when he's describing all these things. Okay, hope you have a great day.